stroke. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S., the number one cause of disability. It's also largely misunderstood and often goes untreated until the damage has passed the point of no return. Stroke, as serious as a heart attack. But it's not about your heart, it's your brain. It's as serious as a brain attack. F-A-S-T, FAST. Looking back on it now, he had a little bit of facial droop. I had no idea um, what that might be. I felt that my right arm contracted and elevated, and I had no control over it. And then I tried to talk. I realized I can't really get the words out. Uh, if you think you're having a stroke, you use 911 and EMS to bring you into an emergency room. Knowing the signs and symptoms and taking action fast could save your life. And having a stroke center close by with all of the specialists, technologies, and treatments, it's critical if you want to have a good recovery. Dr. Ronald Stewart knows this firsthand. Ronald Stewart was born and raised in Odessa, Texas. He had a number of jobs growing up which helped steer him toward a career in medicine. I did like the, the particular biology and so it sort of naturally led, led to medicine as a potential choice. I mean, I wasn't very certain that I could get into medical school. But he did get in and he was off to San Antonio to the University of Texas Health Science Center. I mean, so when we first came to San Antonio, coming from West Texas, I, I thought San Antonio was a lush tropical paradise. It was, uh, there were actually trees, it's very beautiful. At the time, he saw himself pursuing internal medicine or geriatrics, but then came surgery rotations. I uh, liked taking care of the patients and uh, it seemed like a, uh, a very good fit, so I decided I would go into surgery. And he did, staying here to complete his surgical residency after medical school. He found it especially rewarding to care for trauma patients. It's a broad range of patients. It can be really challenging, but most of them get better. In 1993, after a trauma and critical care fellowship in Memphis, he came back to join the trauma team at University Hospital as a member of the UT Health Science Center Department of Surgery. Very quickly, he got involved in the emerging issue of trauma system development. That was relatively new, this idea of a trauma system, you know, what it is and how to do it. Some groundwork had already been done, but there was a lot of heavy lifting left to do. In those early days, as we realized that we were leaving trauma patients stranded in rural hospitals all across the region. They didn't have access to trauma centers. We were relatively blind to it. We didn't see it until we started meeting. He joined a group of physicians in creating the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, or STRAC. It was not easy, but uh, we learned that if we stayed at the table, continued to talk to each other, we naturally grew and learned that if you keep the patient at the center of that, intense competitors can actually work together to improve patient care. Their good work did not go unnoticed. And it was natural for them to then say, well, you know, we have a, another time-sensitive problem, which is stroke. What about layering that on top of this system that already existed? Sure, it made sense. But that didn't mean STRAC Executive Director Eric Epley and Dr. Stewart, who was now chair of STRAC, were enthusiastic about the idea. I'll just say, at the time, I was probably lukewarm to that idea. But after state legislation required all of the state's regional councils to get to work on stroke system development, they started having meetings, a lot of them. But we were not really having very much traction. I would say moving to a real stroke system. Early on, University Health System and the UT Health Science Center stood up a stroke team. Really through the leadership of, uh, of uh, Dr. Sherman and Dr. Hart, who did really uh, laid the framework for the modern treatment of uh, embolic or ischemic strokes, uh, they, they had established a stroke team at University Hospital. But there was no regional approach. 
We didn't have physician leadership that was demanding it. That includes me. Yeah. They kept meeting, but they weren't making any progress. The stakes were high. The amount of time that your brain doesn't have blood flow matters a lot. Minutes can make a difference. Everyone in the room knew this. Why was it so hard? To move a community, to move a system, it, it takes a concerted effort by all of them to do that. They all knew too many stroke patients were experiencing delays in care. On April 16, 2008, that patient was Ray Hildebrand. Ray was an investigator in the Bear County District Attorney's Office. He had a stroke at his office and was taken to the nearest hospital. When they brought him in, his speech was slow, uh, but he, he could speak. Uh, he did have some uh, problems with his right side. His wife, Suzanne, was by his side when they told her they couldn't take care of him there. And then they started trying to find a hospital to take a stroke patient. Seven hours later, Brackenridge Hospital in Austin accepted him. She raced to Austin. He was unconscious when he came off the helicopter. After three weeks in Austin, then skilled nursing and rehab back in San Antonio, Ray remained severely debilitated. And they all told me, well, you know, he lost so much time. So I was angry. Suzanne set up a meeting with Judge Wolf and University Health System President George Hernandez. And George told me about STRAC. I found out about it and called and asked if I could attend the meeting. And I met Dr. Stewart that day. In some ways, was uh, glad that Suzanne was there, okay? Uh, it was a little embarrassing, but by that time I was fully committed. It was a heated meeting. My hair trigger temper took over, and I told him precisely what I thought of the, of the fact that we had nothing in place here to take care of stroke patients. It was personal now. I did tell them, look, you guys, I have atrial fibrillation. I may need you. There was a new sense of urgency. I just said it wasn't, wasn't me. I was being ineffective. The pressure to get something done was strong. Once that was there, and there's like a laser beam focused right on you, it becomes easier. And real progress started happening. And that meeting was the tipping point. Well, now you had uh, all the, every single health system talking about, is this something this is, some, is this something we should do? I had confidence just watching Dr. Stewart. Uh, I had confidence that if he said he was going to do something, he was going to do it. He wasn't telling me what I wanted to hear, and then when I was gone, he was going to forget about it. The emergency response community was now 100% on board. Those are people who were really reached down. They will pull you out of a ditch. And they were moving. They were moving now. And once they're moving, I just pretty much get to be a cheerleader. Ultimately, Baptist Health System opened the region's first stroke center, and University Health System and Methodist followed soon after. By June of 2010, there were eight stroke centers in San Antonio. A month later, after two very difficult years, Ray Hildebrand died from stroke complications. As for Dr. Stewart, sure, he'd made that comment about his AFib, but he never thought he'd need this new stroke system himself. I mean, if I thought I was going to have a stroke, I would have been on anticoagulation. So I did not think I was going to have a stroke. It's like trauma. Nobody thinks they're going to have a stroke. No one thinks they're going to be in a car crash. On December 21st, 2011, Dr. Stewart was supposed to be at a meeting for STRAC in rural South Texas, but the trip got canceled. He stayed home to catch up on email and do some shopping. All of a sudden, something was wrong. Really wrong. Consciousness sort of slipping away. My recollection is it was like 
it's like your visual field is contracting uh, and sort of uh, everything becoming very hazy uh, really quickly. His daughter Elizabeth was home from college. She was standing in the kitchen, but there was no time to alert her. I could no longer see anything, only a gold view, and then I was trying hard to, uh, to maintain consciousness. He put one arm up first and put his other arm up with it, like just kind of holding them both above his head. He couldn't move his right side. In my mind, that's a right hemiparesis. So I have a right hemiparesis. I've already deduced I have a left hemispheric brain issue. And I probably asked it kind of, kind of uh, snappily, like, what are you doing? My brain, though, was working well enough to know, OK, I have an expressive aphasia. My brain said, I need to get to the hospital. And what I told Elizabeth was, I need to go home. I was kind of confused by that, but still wasn't really thinking anything of it and so the next thing I said I think uh, I need a doctor so I need a doctor so I said I need a doctor but I said I need my friends I'm getting out his cell phone <laughs> trying to figure out what friends he might be talking about that he needed to go see like <laughs> frustrated I didn't realize anything was wrong. So I said, okay, I'll try something else. Uh, substitute a word. I need a neurologist. That word came out. It finally clicked. She called EMS and her mother, Sherry, who was at tennis with her brother and sister, Jackson and Mary. So I started walking around the house trying to find aspirin. And I realized, you know, I'm shaking and um, really, really scared. Hello to EMS arrived in a matter of minutes. Dr. Lee Birnbaum, University Hospital Stroke Medical Director, was on stroke call that day. We obtain pre-hospital notification from EMS that there's a stroke patient in transit with an estimated time of arrival. He was met by the stroke team in the emergency room. We uh, quickly uh, examined him, a neurologic exam, confirmed his symptoms, made sure his vital signs were stable, and then the next important step is a CAT scan of the brain. It was an ischemic stroke. A clot was blocking blood flow to his brain. Because he arrived uh, early, he was an excellent candidate to receive uh, IV, TPA, or thrombolytic therapy. He responded well. The goal is that we want that blood clot to uh, dissolve. How was Dr. Stewart feeling? Maybe not what you'd expect. My dominant feeling was gratitude and joy. For Suzanne, who'd rushed to the hospital, seeing Dr. Stewart brought a bit of relief. I felt better, but I was scared to death. Uh, I was just thankful when he looked up at me and smiled and, you know, was talking. Life, even in that moment, was good. To be able to see my, my wife and my family and my children and my friends, so incredibly grateful. That was over. I still have not adequately expressed, I've tried, but I, I still haven't adequately expressed how grateful I felt and how I feel. But later that night? I was not in AFib when I had this stroke, uh, but I went into AFib that night. <sighs> That's a little worrisome. He'd been in AFib thousands of times, but this episode hit home. And I started thinking, you know, I may have another stroke here. That uncertainty, that was scary. And I was really grateful for the nurses at the surgery trauma ICU who, who they let Sherry stay the whole night. They let her, they let her crawl up in the bed. Very grateful. He was able to go home Christmas Eve. Um, Dr. Stewart is uh, um, an ideal case where he uh, really had complete resolution of his symptoms. I went through a basic rehab with respect to, no, I didn't do any rehab program. My rehab was life. But what about work? 
What if he couldn't operate? I was happy to be able to speak. I was happy to be able to see my kids. I was happy to be able to see my wife, to talk. It's a bonus. What else? It's like, I tell that to students today. They say, I must go, I feel like I have to do surgery. No, you don't have to do surgery. You can help so many people. You can help people no matter what you do. About two months later, he had an extensive cognitive evaluation. My, basically, my brain was working fine. Uh, I could tell in a morning report, uh, everything's working fine. One, one of my gifts from a trauma surgery standpoint is I am slow. I, I don't get uh, naturally particularly flustered when there's a lot of stuff going on. The transition back onto the trauma team and into the OR went smoothly. The, the environment that I was entering back into is as safe as any medical environment that you could go into. It's uh, essentially I'm continuously monitored. He was back, something many stroke survivors don't have the opportunity to do. Dr. Stewart uh, did all the right things, where he uh, recognized uh, early that he was having a stroke, that um, his family called 911, and he was brought to a, a stroke center where we could deliver uh, therapies quickly. In addition to being chair of the Department of Surgery, Dr. Stewart is currently serving as chair of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. Through that work, he's now helping to build trauma systems in 179 countries. We've got a pilot in, in South America right now that I think will be successful. I think you'll see trauma centers spring up there. I think you'll see those tra trauma centers then become stroke centers. I think you'll see the, that system way of improving care across, across the globe. He's doing what he can to be healthy and knows he's at risk for another stroke. I don't think about it. I don't dwell on it. It's not a, uh, I know I could. He does try to live a less cluttered life, focusing on what's most important. We don't have unlimited time. We don't have time. We think we have unlimited time, but we have a very limited time. It's very real to me. So is his gratitude for the stroke system he helped to build. Today, University Hospital is the region's only Joint Commission-accredited comprehensive stroke center, and there are 14 stroke centers in San Antonio. That's progress. And it's just like with our trauma patients, I try to emphasize, what's, what's the benefit of one life saved or one life lived? His life, Ray's life. And then people being motivated to do something because of his service and sacrifice and his love. That, to me, is why he's the hero. It's Ray's legacy. He's continuing to serve his community, as he always did. He did it through the great tool of his wife, Suzanne Hildebrand, who they're both heroes. As is Eric Epley and all of the people who responded to the stroke crisis. I feel a little similar to that last scene on saving Private Ryan. Do you know what I'm talking about? I hope that I live true to the things that I need to do.